السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما رب زدنا علما نافئا آمين We are talking about some important concepts which are common between the Jews, the Christians and the Muslims. But our primary purpose is to understand the distortion in the ideology of Ahlul Kitab. In the previous session, we talked about Imago D, which is a very important concept in Christianity, to understand the purpose of creation, particularly the purpose of creating the human being. Man has been created in the image of God. Today, inshallah, we will talk about another important concept in Christianity, but it is common between the three religions. And that concept is about the idea of sin. Idea of sin. Or man is a fallen creature. Man is a fallen creature. This is also intrinsic to Christianity. The idea of sin and redemption of mankind, salvation of mankind. Before we discuss about this idea and the main source of this idea, which is the story of Adam salam in the heaven, let us try to understand the Jewish background. What did Jews believe about the nature of uh, human beings and the purpose of uh, the creation of human beings because this is directly connected with the concept of Im Imago D that's why we mentioned these two topics together because if man has been created in the image of God it means the creation of human beings must be good in principle because God is the source of all goodness and this concept as a human being being good and life uh, being good in itself or positive vision of life this universe the creation around us has purpose it's good this idea became or is in principle incompatible with Christianity, uh, late Christianity, when it became a uh, canonized religion. Because in the Christian faith, uh, they believe in a pessimistic vision of life. Man is born in sin. Man is a fallen creature. So, Sin is a very important concept intrinsic to human life. And to save this human being from sin, God took human form, appeared in space and time in the form, form of Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself. So God sacrificed himself in the form of a human being on the cross 
for the sins of mankind. So this is the redemption or salvation. And whoever believes in Jesus Christ will be saved and he will achieve redemption. This is the foundation of Christianity. But if you believe in a positive outlook of life and positive interpretation of imago D, man has been created in the image of God, how can you reconcile this with the problem of sin? That's why, and we discussed about this, or we pointed to this briefly, the later Christian theologians, scholars, they created this concept of a human being losing the image of God. So a human being by his evil deeds has lost the uh, has lost his nature and has lost the image of God. So salvation is about redeeming this image of God. Okay, because if you believe that man retains this image of God always, that's why we discussed about two important strands of interpretation. Does it mean that a human being has been physically created in the image of God? Or even allegorically, but this image of God remains in every human being, irrespective of his religion, irrespective of his ideology, as a potential to be guided. Or is it about earning this image of God or morality? So those who are evil and wicked and they, are, they have lost their morality, they don't obey the will of God, they have lost the image of God. So this losing image of God became a very important concept in later Christianity. In order to reconcile it with the idea of man as a fallen creature, or the concept of original sin. And as I said, the source is the story of Adam, uh, the father of mankind, committing a sin in the paradise, in Jannah. So this sin is transferred to all mankind till the end times. But why did God Think of redeeming mankind at a particular point of time when he sent Jesus السلام, for the salvation of mankind and he did not think of redeeming mankind before Jesus because from Adam to Moses we have a huge number of human beings. God did not send his begotten son according to Christianity. Of course, we don't believe in it. In these generations, so what about these generations? Why did God send uh, and think of sending or saving mankind at a particular point of time, which is after Moses, when Isa alayhi salam came. Why not before? This is a question we will discuss, inshallah, uh, while we proceed with this, with the explanation of this concept. Now, coming back, we will go to Jewish background. What did Jews believe about the nature of man? The Jewish background, late Judaism or the religious consciousness of the exilic and post-exilic periods down to the time of Jesus had found it contradictory to hold that God was all benevolent and good and at the same time to remain true to a reality in which sin or evil seemed to be the most universal characteristic. So Jews had also developed, developed this negative view of life, particularly in exile and post-exilic periods because they were suffering. So they claimed to be chosen people of God. They claimed to be sons and daughters of God. And the God is God of Banu Israel, not the God of uh, mankind who had been supporting them, who had shown biases in their favor, fulfilling their desire. Suddenly, this God had forsaken them and they were suffering in exile. They were suffering at the hands of their enemies in Babylon. And their uh, kingdom had been destroyed. 
So they were suffering uh, evil, problems, exile, uh, dispersion. These were the main sufferings they had to experience. So this created a negative view of life and God for the Jews who lived in this exilic and post-exilic periods. So for them, sin or evil seemed to be the most universal characteristic. Now they justified this situation by creating the theology of sin. The scholars, their scholars, they said that the reason of this experience, the reason of this suffering is our sin or our sins or our disloyalty with the God of Banu Israel. For the exile and all its sufferings, the post-exilic experience in Judah, which was their kingdom, and all its internal division and treason, its long-standing misery, which was punctuated with invasions, thwarted in insurrections and disperse dispersions, bringing miseries greater and more intense still, all this had filled Jewish consciousness. And they had to face all this suffering in exile. When racialism failed to achieve its objectives because of all these insurmountable obstacles, its logic took over the ground alone, giving full vent to its blunted will. They, want, they tried to solve this problem by the concept of racialism, tribalism, we discussed about that. But it was difficult to solve their problems by this concept in exile, when they were facing uh, humiliation on the hands of non-Jews. So they started creating new theologies. Not only this or that Jew is a sick man, it thought out but all men. Not only this or that Jew is a traitor, an unjust member of society, an evil man. Not only this or that non-Jew is an evil man because of his obstruction of the Jewish racialist dream or his, of, of his abuse and exploitation of the fallen, helpless Jews. No. Not only some human beings are evil, but all men are evil. So before this exile, they would say that non-Jews are evil if they stop the Jews from establishing their racialist dream, establishing their kingdom. So non-Jews, if they do this, they become evil and this is a sin which will destroy the earth. But in exilic and post-exilic periods, they started extending this theology of sin to all mankind. We are suffering because all mankind has become evil in our times. Like you, you may have, if you're following uh, the, of course, everyone is following the Gazan conflict. You may have seen some of their leaders and uh, uh, scholars, Jewish scholars, Zionist uh, speakers also, talking about this, that the reason of evil on this earth are non-Jews, particularly the polytheists, those who commit polytheism with God, with one and only God. But in exile now, they themselves were suffering. So if they were flourishing and everyone else was suffering, it was, it was because of their sins. Now, if the Jew is also suffering, who is responsible? They said that all are responsible. So, not only some human beings are evil, but all men are evil. And this appears in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. Thus the palmist sang, if thou, palms is the section of Bible, which is attributed to Dawud the songs of Dawud we know Quran also maintains that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed Zabur on Dawood, which was a book of dua and azkar. And he would uh, sing the praises of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in such a way that the mountains and the birds and all creation would sing with him in harmony. Such would be the uh, greatness of this ibadah by Dawood so palms is the section which contains uh, azkar which contains 
uh, the the songs praise of God. Thus the palmist sang, If thou, Lord, shall dost mark iniquities, iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? And enter not into judgment with thy servant, for in thy sight shall no man living be justified. He did not forget to give us the irrefutable evidence for that which determined his thought in making this unwarranted generalization that all people have become corrupt. In the next verse he says, For the enemy hath persecuted my soul, he hath smited my life down to the ground, he hath made me to swell in darkness. Because this was the case, this was the experience at that moment in exile. As those that have been long dead, therefore in my spirit overwhelmed within me, my heart within me is desolate. The condemnation of man himself as hopelessly addicted to evil was made in light of the empirical reality of evil around and within Jewish society. Because evil was around Jewish society, they were, they were in exile, they were suffering. So all human beings must be evil. Jewish consciousness cultivated this condemnation to the point of obsession. It became an obsession. Then the inductive leap to the universal generalization was easy. So they did not restrict it to themselves. We are suffering because we are evil. We have forsaken the law of God. So we need to repent and come back to God. No, we are suffering because everyone has become evil. Then the inductive lap to the universal generalization was easy. Looking for an explanation of its universality, Jewish consciousness hit upon heredity. So the reason they explained was heredity. And it is sin has been uh, it, it has been inherited from the parents. So if a person is evil, he has inherited it from his parents. Inheritance by children of the consequences of their parents' evil deeds was not unknown. N neither were the facts of nurture to evil which must have been equally given in the empirical reality. It was natural to interpret this as heredity. And it was then that the lamenting palmist exclaimed, again in palms it appears this verse is in the Bible, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin, in wrong, and in sin did my mother conceive me. I am evil because my mother has conceived me in sin. I am sinful because my parents are sinful. Certainly this is still far from the packetist thesis of Christianity. We will come to that. So in uh, Jewish consciousness, the Jews also started this idea of man as a fallen creature. But they did not go to the extent of Christians and Christianity. We will come to that. But it was the Jewish religion which started this idea, particularly in exile. When they were in exile and suffering, they... Uh, created this ideology of sin. We are in exile, we are suffering, we have to face all these in iniquities because mankind has become evil. And why are we sinful? Because of heredity. Our parents have given birth to us in sin. So it is not only sins of particular individuals. It is the the ideology of sin was expanded to generations. And now this uh, idea, what was the source for the Jews? How would they justify this idea of mankind being sinful and inheriting this sin from uh, the parents? There must be a cataclysmic event. An event, an incident, which led to this uh, which led to this idea of sin. Dr. Ismail says, the Jewish speculative mind scanned the scriptures for such a cataclysmic, uh, cataclysmic event that would explain the irrational entry of evil into the world. How did uh, evil enter this world? In spite of the fact that God is the source of all good. And this is a basic idea in all religions. God is good. God is not evil. 
monotheistic religions, of course. There are polytheistic religions like Zoroastrianism, uh, fire worshippers, who believe in two gods, the god of good and god of evil. Why? Because the problem of evil uh, has engaged all religions and even philosophy. The problem of evil. If God is good and the source of all good, where does evil come from? This is a question. Does pure evil exist? And the evil we see around us in the form of uh, wars, natural disasters, death, suffering, whatever. Is this pure evil or it contains aspects of good? This is a very important philosophical uh, chapter discussed in religion as well. So if God is the source of all good, and this is maintained in Islam also. For example, in the Quran, when Allah says, to Allah belongs all good names. How do we know God? By his names and attributes. So all attributes of God, names and attributes are good. There is not even one attribute which is evil. Good attributes, good names will lead to good. For example, in the dua of the Prophet ﷺ, he would say, Al khayru kulluhu biyadayk, wa sharru laysa ilayk. All good comes and emanates from you, O Allah. And evil is not attributed to you. Famous dua. So where does evil come from? Or if evil has happened and it's a reality, we cannot deny the existence of evil. It is there. There is sin. There is uh, suffering. There is murder, killing. There are all forms of evil in this world exist, evil exists. If it does not come from God or God did not will it in, in principle, where does it come from? What is that cataclysmic event which led to evil? And this is a very important question in all religions. In Christianity and Judaism in particular, why are we discussing this? This ideology influences the human being who believes in, in this ideology. So, for example, if a Jew, for his suffering, blames all mankind, what would be his vision towards mankind? He would not see them as human beings. I want you to appreciate the theology and ideology of Ahlul Kitab in carving their mentality and practice. So what we do in practice with ourselves, in a society, with other human beings, our behavior, it will be carved by the ideology I believe in. Right? So this is important to understand what is going on in our times also. So this question, what is that cataclysmic event which led to evil, was addressed in Judaism, in Christianity and Islam. Coming back to the Jews, the first fruit of their endeavor was the story of the fallen angels. So this cataclysmic event was fallen angels. Some angels who are good and they come from the source of good. God has created them in, uh, on the foundation of good and khair. Some of these angels, they disobeyed God and they became fallen angels. They were casted out from the heavenly realm which is uh, the realm of goodness they cannot stay there because they are not good anymore and shaitan himself in these narrations is a fallen angel and there is disagreement between mufassirun in islamic tradition also about shaitan was shaitan satan an angel or a jinn uh, the soundest opinion is that he was a jinn because we have a very uh, precise and clear ayah about that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Kana min al -jinni. He is from the jinn. Fafasaqa an amri rabbi. And he disobeyed his Lord and he transgressed. But we have this dis discussion. We have this disagreement. So Satan himself is a fallen angel. This cataclysmic event which started uh, the uh, advent of evil in this world is the story of the fallen angels in the Old Testament. 
the first fruit of their endeavor, yani the first fruit of the endeavor of Jews, because they had to justify the evil. Where did the evil? Where did where did it come from? What is that cataclysmic event which changed the mankind altogether? It is the story of fallen angels. Not that they fabricated it, but they joined it to such interpretation as would solve for them the issue in question. The first six verses of Genesis. I have said the Genesis is the first book of Bible, Old Testament. The first six verses of Genesis 6 have been used as a prelude to the deluge, deluge story. But in reality, they come from another document in which no trace of the deluge is in evidence. For in Numbers 12, 13, uh, 12, 33, and this, he's quoting the Bible, descendants of the giants or fallen angels are said to have been in Palestine at the time of Joshua's invasion. And when uh, in the Bible, God commanded Moses to lead his nation to the promised land, to Palestine. But when he came near to the promised land, God deemed Moses unworthy of entering the promised land. And Moses appointed Joshua uh, as his inheritor to lead the Bani Israel into the promised land. This is biblical version. So when this Joshua's invasion happened, when he entered the Palestine, it was inhabited by the descendants of the same fallen angels or giants. Very interesting. Whereas in the deluge story, they are said to have all been destroyed. There is contradiction between these books. So, uh, this is the cataclysmic event that led to evil in this world. Evil comes from the fallen angels. And in Palestine, at the time of Joshua's invasion, the descendants of these fallen angels angels or giants as they have been called in, in, in Bible, they are said to have been in Palestine at that time. And they were descendants of these fallen angels. So this is about uh, the Jewish background. Now coming to the Christianity. And in Christianity it is more clear. The main one of the main foundations of Christian faith is um, the concept of original sin. All human beings are sinful. Original sin. And what is the source of that sin? Now, for Christianity, what is the cataclysm, cataclysmic event? It is the story of Adam. Adam committed this sin and this sin transferred to uh, all his progeny till the end times, to all his, to all mankind, to all human beings. And how, how, how did God save mankind from this original sin? By sending his begotten son or coming himself in space and time and uh, sacrificing himself for mankind. Why? Because God loved mankind so much that he sacrificed himself and his begotten son who is God and human being incarnate together uh, for mankind. So in Christianity we have this concept of love. For this reason Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran uh, said that they are nearer to the believers than the Jews. Quran clearly said that the most uh, the, the, the most, the staunchest enemies of, of Muslims and believers are Al-Yahud, the Jews, and the polytheists. And the nearest to them are the Christians. Why? Because Christians believe in this concept of love, God as love, uh, which is falsehood according to Islam because we have to understand God. Yes, we understand God by his attributes, but all attributes. We have to understand God in a balanced way. We cannot overemphasize one attribute on the expense of other. So they have overemphasized or obsession with only one attribute, which is love. Okay. So this is the concept of original sin. But 
uh, with the passage of time in Christian theology, because Christianity after Isa alayhi salam, we have the original message of Isa alayhi salam. And then it was distorted by uh, the later Christians, particularly Paul, who was a Pharisee in principle. So Paul was a Pharisee. He was a Jew who converted to Christianity and he uh, interpreted Christianity in his own way. We as Muslims say that he distorted Christianity or he distorted the original message of Jesus. And after that, we have uh, the Hellenistic age, the Greek uh, ideology, which was manifested in the Roman Empire and uh, uh, Roman Emperor became Christian. So the Roman Empire accepted Christianity as religion. And then we have the Christian theologians. So they expanded this idea of original sin to whole creation. So it is not only human being, who is uh, a negative uh, being, but whole creation. That's why uh, in later Christianity, they connected the concept of salvation with leaving this world altogether, becoming a monk. And this, uh, this, uh, this appears in other religions like Buddhism. So in Buddhism, the main philosophy is Nirvana. Uh, nirvana uh, uh, the idea of salvation. How do you achieve salvation? And from what to achieve salvation? From this dunya. Because this dunya is, a, is, is, is evil. It is painful. And uh, so how should we achieve salvation? By, uh, by retiring to the caves. By disengaging from dunya altogether. Becoming a monk. In Islam also we have this concept of uh, Zuhud, which is not like Christianity and Buddhism. Yeah, and disconnecting from dunya while engaging with dunya, not uh, fleeing away from dunya or disconnecting from dunya, not adopting this defeatist mentality and a negative outlook of dunya. So Christianity developed from the concept of original sin, it developed a negative attitude towards dunya itself. That's why the West never adopted uh, the scientific culture or the scientific method until they disconnected from religion, from Christianity. This, because Christianity as a religion stood as a hurdle in the path of scientific revolution. This is not the case in Islam. Islam from the very beginning promoted science. In Islam, uh, we have this positive outlook towards dunya. Dunya has been created for mankind with khair. Everything is good. Human being is khair in himself. He is not, he was not created in the, uh, with this original sin. Adam alayhi salam is a great prophet. He is not the reason uh, for uh, the destruction of all mankind. He committed the sin, which was a test for him. And we'll come to the explanation. He committed the sin, which was a test, but he also repented for the sin. And God, he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he accepted the repentance and forgave uh, Adam alayhi salam. So sin is an individualistic matter. And Quran emphasized it many times. That no one will carry the burden of the other. You will not carry the sin of your parents. Your parents not, will not carry your sin. There are mutual responsibilities involved. But morality is an individualistic matter. So if you're good, God will deal with you in a separate way. If your brother is evil, God will deal with him in a separate way. If your parents are good, God will deal with them in a separate manner. And if you are evil as children, God will deal with you in a separate manner. This is the message of the Quran. So Christianity, with this concept of original sin, in its history developed a very uh, pessimistic 
and negative outlook of life. It is not only human being who is evil and sinful, but this creation is all evil. What is being claimed by Christianity here is on the contrary, that sin is a universal and necessary phenomenon, that all men have, all men have sinned and will sin. Indeed, that sin is rooted into the very nature of man, so that the sinless man is unless applied to Jesus Christ in his dual divine human capacity attributed to him in Christian doctrine, a contradiction in terms. I'm quoting, I'm reading uh, quotes here and there, some paragraphs. We, can, we cannot read whole chapter. And this was not the original message of Jesus. Isa alayhi salam came with a very clear message. He did not come. This is a distortion which happened, particularly by Paul and other Jewish scholars. So, uh, when the Christians and Christian faith believes in sin, what does it mean? By asserting that sin is, so we have these two important uh, dogmatic claims. Number one is, God is. This is common between all religions. God is the existence of God and understanding everything based on this foundation is uh, common to all religions because all religions they believe in one form or other they have the concept of God. There are some atheistic religions as well. Again the example of Buddhism will not go into that but the major religions they have this concept of God. God is and everything should be understood in the light of this concept of God. Uh, the purpose of life, afterlife, what should I do in this dunya, the morality, law should be understood in this, in this light. That's why all major religions, main, main religions, they have the concept of law. They have, yani they, they were holistic religions. They were not, they, they did not contain only rituals, including the religions which give myth a very uh, high importance, like Hinduism. Hinduism is a religion based on myth. But even in Hinduism, you will find law. Manusmriti is a very important book in Hinduism which deals with law. So all major religions, they have this concept of how to lead our life based on injections coming from God. However, Christianity is different in this regard because they added a second constant or a foundation in religious experience and that is sin is. So this life must be interpreted according to these two concept, concepts. God is and sin is. What is the meaning of sin is? By asserting that sin is, the Christian is not asserting that empirical truth is not asserting the empirical truth that some men sin, do wrongly, act unjustly and commit evil. By saying that sin is, they don't mean to assert the obvious, which we all know. The existence of sin around us. Some people are wrong, some commit adultery, some act unjustly, some commit evil. This is understood. They don't mean this. This truth is a platitude and from it nothing flows for either religion or ethics as Christianity understands them. This is not important. Yani empirical understanding of sin, existence of actual sin around us. All human beings accept it, accept it even atheists. Even atheists, yani, uh, the foundation of atheism, one of the foundations is on the problem of evil. If God is good, God is perfect, where does this imperfection and evil come from? And this is the base from the basic premises of atheism. So even atheists accept that some people are wrong, this is wrong, this is right, this is good, this is evil. So what do Christians mean when they what, what do Christians mean when they say sin is and or from this idea of sin? Sin or evil is truly contingent here. For of any evil action by any man it is always possible to say that it could not have been done and that something else might have been done in its stead had other determinants entered the situation in which it had taken place. What is being claimed by Christianity? Now listen to this. 
what is being claimed by Christianity here is, on the contrary, that sin is a universal and necessary phenomenon. So they don't mean that sin exists. We all know that. Non-Christians know that. By sin is, they mean that sin is a universal and necessary phenomenon. And the life must be understood based on the concept of sin. That all men have sinned and will sin. Indeed, that sin is rooted into the very nature of man. This is what they mean. Christianity is perfectly prepared to accept the empirical reality which is always contingent of goodness. As regards evil, however, Christianity is adamantly dogmatic and assertive. Sin or evil is necessary, universal and inextricably involved in human nature. So basically, sin is the highest philosophy Christianity offered to mankind. Everything must be interpreted, understood based on this philosophy of sin. Even God himself, God himself, sin of the world laid heavy on the God himself. And this idea of sin, Dr. Ismail has called it uh, pecketism. This is his term. Yani a pessimistic vision of life and human beings. He says, this aspect of Christianity, for lack of a better name, I propose to call pecketism. It is the most fundamental premise of Christian anthropology and history, indeed of all Christian theology. It provides the starting point of the Christian faith as a whole. For it, at the starting point, it is admitted that evil is not necessary and goodness is possible, a wholly different faith than Christianity would follow. So Christianity is based on two important premises. Number one, Evil is necessary and good is not possible. He says, for if at that starting point it is admitted that evil is not necessary and good is possible, a wholly different faith than Christianity would follow. So if you believe that evil is not necessary, Evil is contingent. Evil happens because of different reasons. But evil does not define a human being. Evil does not define this universe. And goodness is possible. You are not a Christian. Because in Christianity it is the opposite. So he says about God. To create the heavens and the earth cost, costs him no labor, no anguish. To take away the sin of the world costs him his own life blood. Ajeeb. Very strange. And these are uh, these are quotations from either Bible or the Christian scholars. Early scholars, late scholars, I am not quoting them. You can see it in the book. So he says, one of them says, to create the heavens and the earth costs him no labor. When God created heavens and the earth, it did not cost him any labor, no anguish. To take away the sin of the world costs him, that is God, his own life, because he himself came into this world. One is tempted to think that the most absolute and fundamental first principle which any adherent of the greatest monotheistic faiths would want to hold is that God is. Yani, any monotheistic religion, people who believe in one God, they would, uh, they would adhere or they would uh, think that the most absolute, fundamental, foundational principle should be God is. Existence of one God and understanding everything based on this concept. This any Christian will most enthusiastically grant, but he will add it to, to a second. He will add to it a second. And this second is that sin is. So sin is a very important concept in Christianity. It is fundamental to mankind. Everything should be understood and interpreted based on this concept of sin. Uh, he says, however, the life and death of Jesus Christ on earth has its own presuppositions and the most fundamental of them is the reality, universality and absoluteness of sin. And the purpose of Jesus Christ is also sin is the purpose of God and sin is also the purpose of Jesus Christ. Yes.
So the concept of sin. Now, for Christianity, what is the cataclysmic event and what is the source? It is the story of Adam. So if you compare the story of Adam uh, from Bible and Quran, uh, you'll be astonished to see the differences. Because uh, Dr. Ismail writes here, the contrast of the Genesis treatment of the Adam story and in the Bible, the story of Adam, with that of the Quran is quite revealing on this point. Far from being the father of sin, the Quran regards Adam as the father of the prophets. He received his learning directly from God. And in this, he was superior to the angels to whom he, to whom he taught the names of the creatures. This is in the Quran, the story of Adam, which appears many times in the Quran. God commanded him to pursue the good as well as to avoid evil. The latter being the nature of the tree whose fruit he was forbidden to eat. The identification of the tree as the tree of life and of knowledge of good and evil is neither God's nor Adam's. It is not in, in the Quran, but it is the work of priestly editors, those who edited the Bible and they, uh, they added many things to it. Who branded knowledge of good and evil as evil in pursuit of their will to power and for the preparation of their monopoly over, over man's access to God. Aware of these priestly editions, the Quran calls this wrong identification a lie told by Satan in order to lure Adam, prone as he was to know and pursue the good to transgress God's command to do evil. Satan, the Quran tells, enticed Adam, saying, O Adam, shall I show you the tree of life and power eternally? Adam ate of the tree and committed a transgression and an evil deed. But God corrected him and he atoned what was rightly guided. So God corrected Adam. And he guided Adam. Adam therefore did commit a misdeed. No doubt in that. And what was this misdeed? It was not evil nature of the Adam. It was that of thinking evil to be good. This was an ethical misjudgment. That's why there are some scholars who have this beautiful interpretation of Adam eating the fruit and committing sin. Because a Muslim wonders how did a great prophet who was so near to Allah created by Allah directly, who was living in Jannah, uh, commit such a mistake. He was not able to con control his stomach. How come? Some scholars, because Adam was a great prophet, this is uh, unimaginable about him. Some scholars, they say, Adam wanted, and by this act, Adam wanted nearness to God. Because nearness to God is more profound in Jannah than on earth. That's why uh, this, uh, the consequence of this sin was fall to the ground, fall to the earth. As Allah explained and used this word in the Quran, ihbitu, go down to the earth. So he was on a higher level in Jannah and near to God. And when shaitan misled him and told him that if you eat from this fruit, you will remain forever in Jannah. So Adam wanted to remain forever in Jannah, not for worldly, uh, for, for the pleasures of Jannah and for desires, but to maintain the nearness to God. So this was an ethical misjudgment, not, a, not an evil in itself. While shaitan in the Quranic view, Satan in the Quranic view, is the evil thought suggesting itself to man that he may give it real existence. Adam is the author of the first human mistake in ethical perception, committed with good intention under Enthusiasm for the good. It was not a fall, but a discovery that the good is possible to confuse with the evil, that its pursuit is neither unilateral nor straightforward. It was not a fall, but a discovery that good is possible to confuse with the evil. There is possibility that good can be confused, could be confused with the evil. And uh, we have to the morality necessitates that we have to remain upright in our ethical judgments. We should not confuse good with evil and evil with good. This was the lesson God gave to Adam. 
that its pursuit is neither unilateral nor straightforward. However, if you read the story from Christian perspective, it is completely different. Now, this is a positive thing, teaching Adam how to deal with good and evil, how to prefer good and evil, between, preference between good and evil. The Christian narrative of the Bible is about evil nature of the of, 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 of humanity, human beings and this creation. Inshallah, we'll continue with this discussion in the next session, which will be the last in this course. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us understanding and to make us from those who choose evil, uh, who choose good on evil and stay away and abstain from evil. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from evil and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us best of dunya and akhirah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by his beautiful names and his exalted attributes to give us uh, best of dunya and akhirah, to accept our martyrs, to forgive our dead and to elevate our ranks when we leave this dunya. Ameen, Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala nabi al-ummi. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.